to today's version of uh, uh, our international English problem seminar. So yeah, I'm very happy to have Ken Golden, a uh, distinguished professor from Utah, to talk about on thinning ice, modeling and monitoring sea ice in a warming climate. So Ken has been working on sea ice, both from the real perspectives as well as the mathematical perspectives. Some, so we have very, um, very many trips also to Arctic and Antarctica. So we are very excited to have him here today to talk about sea ice. Thank you, Ken. Sure. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Newt and Katya, for inviting me. This is just great you know, to be able to, to visit with you all uh, today. And so, um, Again, I'm going to tell you about, uh, give you an overview of our mathematical uh, research on uh, on sea ice, on sea ice processes and structures, and the role of sea ice uh, in Earth's climate system. However, um, given that this is an inverse problem seminar, um, you know, I'm going to mention, not necessarily go into all the details, but certainly mention as we go along all these different inverse problems. In fact, as I was as I was preparing for this, it was like every single thing that we do in the field, it's like, oh, it's some form of inverse problem. It might be a simple one, but basically it's an inverse problem. So and I, I dug up this old photo, one of my favorite photos from a long, long time ago, and this is called the Warbot. Um, and this is actually um, a, a device for measuring the thickness of sea ice. So it's sending down a, a long electromagnetic waves and uh, an induction process, and it's basically trying to get an estimate of the thickness of sea ice. And this is one of the biggest holy grails of climate science. And you'll see why it's such a difficult, such a difficult problem. So it's called the Warbot because it's named after Tony Warby, who was uh, uh, a big sea ice scientist in Australia. So, so why study sea ice? Well, um, there's a lot of it still. It covers about oh, roughly 12% of Earth's ocean surface, but it fluctuates a lot. It forms the uh, the very thin frozen boundary layer between the two principal geophysical fluids on the Earth, mainly the ocean and the atmosphere. It mediates the exchange of uh, heat and gases and momentum between, uh, between the ocean and atmosphere. Both the melting and the freezing of sea ice play a major role in global ocean circulation and one of the principal ways that sea ice communicates with the rest um, of, the, of the world. Uh, as you'll see, uh, sea ice hosts a very rich ecosystem perhaps the richest in, in the world. And uh, as this thin frozen layer, um, sea ice is a sensitive indicator of our, of our warming climate. Now, one of the biggest jobs that the sea ice pack plays is in reflecting incoming solar radiation during the, uh, during the, the polar summer. So this is measured by the albedo, uh, which is the ratio of reflected sunlight to incident sunlight. And whereas white snow and ice reflect most of the incoming solar radiation, um, seawater or meltwater sitting on the surface of sea ice absorbs most of that incoming radiation. So if you start to lose the ice pack, well, you're replacing that white reflective surface with a much dark, with a darker absorptive surface. So it's like a double whammy. Um, and of course, that's the issue is that we are losing uh, the summer Arctic sea ice pack at a, at a precipitous rate. So here is the sort of the uh, average over the early satellite era, about seven, seven million square kilometers. Um, around the turn of the millennium, we started really descending. We had a record low in 2012, bounced back, but we're almost down there uh, again. And you can say, I mean, look at the numbers that were, you know, we've lost on the order of half, not some tiny little amount and not over millions of years or thousands of years, but over the space of, 20, 30 years, which is, which is pretty amazing. Um, to put this in some geographical perspective, um, here's kind of where it used to be. And this is, uh, this is the minimal extent in September. So this was just last September, our last minimum um, in here, as you can see how much we've lost. But I want you to, to note this hole in the center. So it used to be a lot bigger. And this is an inherent feature of the satellite tracks, the way satellites get their data. So this is called the polar data gap. And one of the really cool inverse problems that I'll tell you about right at the end is how we fill that data gap in. And we have NASA interested in this and NSIDC and NOAA, places that, you know, to update their climate record. Because the bottom, the, the basic issue is, well, it used to be everybody assumed that there was 100% sea ice concentration at the North Pole. But now with global warming, there's not. And so, so what do you do with that? And you, you're not going to have accurate long-term records and so on if you so miss... Uh, uh, you know, have inaccurate data of what's going on in this North Polar region. So ultimately, predicting what may come next um, requires lots of math modeling. 
Certainly the most likely is at some point we're gonna reach ice-free summers, might be stabilized, might be recover. Well, I mean, I think most of the predictions are uh, unless somehow we were able to suck all the CO2 out of, out of the atmosphere and shut down all, all emissions, uh, and then kind of, you know, it'll still take a long time. Anyway, who, who knows? But we're, we're most likely headed for ice-free summers in the Arctic at some point, maybe the next 20, 30, 40 years. From a, a modeling perspective, so there are these IPCC reports that come out every four or five years, and this is a little bit of historical perspective and kind of motivates a lot of the work that's been done in sea ice modeling. And so while all the world's uh, best uh, global climate models predict the general decline of, of uh, Arctic sea ice in the summertime, um, the issue was, was that the ice was melting much more rapidly than any of these models was predicting. So this presents a fundamental challenge. How do you represent sea ice more realistically in climate models, ultimately to improve the projections? And in particular, how do you account for key processes, such as these melt ponds, these beautiful geometrical uh, structures that form as the sea ice melts, but only in the Arctic. You don't see these things in the Arctic. It's another interesting question. Um, uh, anyway, but the point, but part of the point is, how do you incorporate incorporate these very important ponds, uh, which really affect long-term simulations? In other words, if you incorporate them, you know, then you're getting you're getting much more accurate uh, uh, predicted rates of melting because you're you're accounting for how much energy is actually being absorbed by the ice. And um, however, these are much smaller scale features. The details of these are far smaller than coarse grained climate models. And so this presents a fundamental pro problem that many of you know the word homogenization. How do you upscale? How do you account for these small, these fine features and their impact on much larger scales? And this is particularly challenging for sea ice, which is a complex multi-scale material with complex composite structure varying over about 10 orders of magnitude. It's pretty, it's pretty dramatic. So here's the, um, the brine inclusions in sea ice as, as it freezes. Um, here's its polycrystalline structure. Depends on the kind of uh, formation processes, the, 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 the processes under, the conditions under which the ice was formed. These tiny little brine inclusions can form much larger uh, structures, these connected structures through which fluid can flow. Moving up in scale, um, here's some of the beautiful geometry of these Arctic melt ponds, which I'll talk a fair bit about, um, Antarctic pressure ridges. Um, and then the ice pack itself is a complex composite material. Instead of fluid inclusions in an ice host, it's ice flows in a fluid host, the ocean. And this is from space. Okay, so when you're dealing with composite materials, one of the biggest issues, again, as I mentioned, is how do you go from the micro scale to the macro scale? How do you get, it, how do you use information about the micro scale, say how the, the two different materials, a good conductor sigma one and a bad conductor sigma two, um, how do you compute the overall or effective complex conductivity in this case that you see on, that you observe on much larger scales? So that's the forward problem. And then the inverse problem is you make these bulk measurements and then you want to go backwards. You want to, you want to uh, infer or recover information about the microstructure that led to that um, bulk behavior that you observe. And of course, the, this, 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 this problem has a long and story history going back to Maxwell, Einstein, who worked on say the effective conductivity of a dilute suspension of spheres, problem like this, but in the, more, in the dilute limit. And then, of course, in the 20th century with Wiener, Hushing, and Strickman, um, a lot of stuff that was done at Utah, all sorts of you know, various math, math departments and theoretical physics, people uh, making mathematical advances, no longer just using trial and error, but making mathematical advances and predicting the properties of composite materials. And, um, uh, and this has certainly accounted for some, the incredible widespread use of composite structures throughout science, engineering, uh, industry, medicine, and so on. Okay, so, what, so what's this talk about? Well, um, I'm gonna tell you how we're using these methods of homogenization and statistical physics to, multi, to model the sea ice effective behavior and ultimately advance uh, how sea ice is represented in climate models as well as in larger scale process studies. Um, and I'm gonna tell you, we're certainly gonna go from the micro scale to the meso scale to the macro scale, but of course I'm also going to be pointing out 
and focusing on specific inverse problems, the inverse homogenization or other inverse problems as we as we go along. And by the way, um, one of the I, I know I, I know uh, Newt and Margaret will recall uh, these and, and Gunzer. So um, in some sense, the subtitle of the talk is almost uh, not a tour of CF, but a, a tour of Herdlot's functions and their applications in in forward and inverse homogenization. Because almost all the kind of half the problems that we look at, we are somehow able to manipulate it into a, a Herdlot's function setting. So one of the things that distinguishes how we approach this as mathematicians is the various ingredients. You, you, I'm not sure if you'll see all these in this talk, but these are the various kinds of things we, we use. Electrical engineering, stealth technology, that you'll see. Porous media, oil extraction. Now that technology, mathematical technology, gets used in carbon sequestration, for example. Statistical mechanics of ferromagnets, Anderson localization, and the basic physics of semiconductors and metals, random matrix theory, differential equations, stochastic processes. These are all the kinds of ingredients that go into our modeling as mathematicians, because we don't really care where the math comes from. But then we have lots of impact and implications across various because of, for the same reason. A lot of, most of our work is, is, is implications into climate modeling, the physics of sea, the physics and biology of sea ice. Um, I should mention that we've had a large um, emerging sort of group and activity in sea ice ecology connected to all our sea ice physics, where the physics sort of controls a lot of the biology. I won't go into that here, but that's just one of the things that we're, is really emerging. There's tons of inverse problems there. Um, the theory of composite materials and polycrystalline materials, uh, remote sensing, infection diffusion processes, biomedical imaging and biomaterials, and, uh, and of course, polar microbial ecology, which is this emerging sort of area that we're looking into. Now, what you'll see a lot of also is where we, you know, sort of where we take specific methods from seemingly unrelated areas to sea ice and bring them over to sea ice because the underlying mathematics is the same. And I like to call this cross-pollination. And these are some of the examples, some of the other kinds of areas in science, magnets, radar absorbers, human bone, and rat brains that we'll use to study sea ice. Okay, so how do these scales, these disparate scales link up? Well, on the smallest scale, the, the brine microstructure and the topography of the snow conspire together to determine the geometry of the ponds, kind of what you're looking at. But then on the larger scale, you want to up, upscale that to what's the overall albedo. And then, of course, upscaling that to sort of the, the, global, the global scale. So let's focus on the micro scale. So by the way, this is the first big inverse problem, is basically people have been studying sea ice for you know, a long, long time. And Basically, a lot of the kind of microstructural work was done by you do a slice of ice, you take photographs, and you try to put it all put it together, or under cross polarizers for for, for uh, crystallographic structure. But we were the first in the GRL in 2007 to develop an X-ray tomography method um, for the brine microstructure of sea ice and how it depend how it changes dramatically with temperature. No pathways, one pathway many pathways of connectedness through this very complex. And by the way, this is a centimeter across. So that's the scale we're looking at. Okay, now fluid flow through the porous microstructure of sea ice um, mediates and governs all kinds of processes that are important in the climate system as well as in ecosystems. So these melt ponds, whether or not these ponds pool up and grow or drain overnight completely changes the albedo. And that's the Fluid, the fluid permeability properties of the ice underneath. Um, here's some of this algae, and they get their nutrients through um, uh, through fluids flowing through the uh, the, the, sea, the the porous microstructure. So, of course, we're interested in the fluid permeability of a porous medium, where we the average velocity is related to the pressure gradient through a uh, color, say a, thir, a, a, a a fluid conductivity, the denominator of which is the viscosity. And the numerator is the homogenized parameter, the fluid permeability tensor that we're interested in, because you, you can have different uh, abilities for fluid to flow. You really do in sea ice. It's highly anisotropic. Now, one of the, the key things that I sort of discovered while out in the middle of a storm in, in, a, in Antarctica, uh, where I saw, I, I visually saw seawater flooding the surface and then kind of did an inverse problem in my head and knew that I was kind of looking at a percolation threshold for the brine microstructure in sea ice. You know, assuming it just sort of all clicked because I've been studying this stuff for 15 years and it all in an instant just sort of came together in a moment 
um, where I realized that there was this on off switch for fluid flow um, that was being induced by a transition connectedness of the brine microstructure. So roughly speaking for brine volume fractions below about 5%, uh, sea ice is effectively in, uh, impermeable in the vertical direct, columnar sea ice is effectively impermeable in the vertical direction. And for brine volume fractions above 5%, it's, um, uh, it's permeable and increasingly so with increasing temperature or brine volume fraction. And this 5% critical brine volume fraction, just kind of by coincidence, um, corresponds to a critical temperature of minus five Celsius for a typical bulk salinity of five parts per thousand. And this has become known as the, the rule of fives. And it controls many of the fundamental processes uh, within, in the internal workings of in the physics and biology of sea ice. And so, as I said, I kind of realized when I was out on the ice that it was a, that it was a percolation threshold that I, that I was witnessing. And so uh, the basic percolation model, the simplest is say a two-dimensional square lattice. Um, we flip a coin, a weighted coin, oh, uh, a bond is open with probability P, closed with probability one minus P. And then here about a third of them are filled. And so we're not in a connected or permeable state because the electricity or fluid tries to flow through there, but um, it gets stuck and go for a while, but it gets stuck. Um, but here now at two thirds here, now we have, there's a connected pathway and this is an infinite lattice and it goes in, we have an infinite connected cluster of open bonds. And then you, the natural question is, well, what's the smallest P for which there's an infinite open cluster. And um, for this 2D square lattice, it's exactly one half or 50%. So that led to the first sort of fundamental puzzle, like well, why in the world is sea ice at 5%? And there's an excluded volume effect um, where, uh, where the brine is not sort of just randomly distributed like a, like a Bernoulli process in a, in a lattice, but, but um, there's a, an excluded volume effect where it lives on the little boundaries between the pure ice platelets. And I guess probably in, probably in graduate school, I probably, you know, used to read all kinds of papers and materials. And I, and basically all it amounted to was I remembered this picture of, a, of what was called a compressed powder microstructure. And I simply realized, oh yeah, there was that picture. This, the microstructure looked very similar. So I went back to that paper and these people that were developing compressed powders, which were used in the, uh, uh, develop, in the development of so-called stealthy coatings for aircraft that absorb radar rather than reflecting it, um, they use these microstructures because the, the particles were expensive. It's like silver. So you want to you want to minimize the cost. And so you use big polymer particles and little metal particles. And so then they they developed a theory to calculate the percolation threshold, the required volume fraction of the small particles to percolate to get radar absorbing characteristics. And I simply literally did five measurements with a ruler and I plugged it into their theory and out popped the 5% and explained all kinds of beautiful data on algal growth and ice production and so on. But because of this, and this is one of the fundamental challenges of inverse theory for measuring the thickness of sea ice. Sea ice is like, a, because of this, it's like a radar absorbing composite, it is. Most of the microwaves, just you know, standard, standard microwaves from a satellite get absorbed. And so you have to you know, go through all kinds of contortions to try to actually you know, really get your hands on the thickness of the sea ice. Okay, sort of the next big step was um, uh, how do you, okay, what's the, you know, how do you calculate or estimate the fluid permeability? And so we use percolation theory, but a lot of other, there's this sort of this mix of continuum theory and lattice theory in the right places. And anyway, so we came up with a deceptively simple, uh, well, well multifaceted theory, I should say, one of which was this percolation formula for the fluid permeability, which matches up incredibly well with field data. There's the 5% threshold. There's the best value for the critical exponent. That's stuff I used to work on prior to re-entering the sea ice world. Um, and there's a constant in front, which is by no, it's not just a fudge factor that we fit to the data. It is, we actually estimate this from our X-ray tomography, estimating the, the, the size of the, of the throats, these narrow throats. That determines the leading order behavior of the homogenized coefficient. And it turns out, this is actually what's known as critical path analysis. In, and was originally developed in Ambi Gauker, Halperin, and Langer for in the context of hopping conduction and dope semiconductors. And then I know that uh, Newt and maybe Gunter probably remember Sergei Kozlov. And so Kozlov and I, this was oh, this was fascinating because we experienced, we were, we I went to visit him in August of 1991, and we uh, I came down one morning and uh, well, 
there was the coup against Gorbachev. And so we went into Red Square, we saw the tanks, and you know, you know you're watching history. Anyway, it was during that time with Sergei that we read, we didn't know that they had done that, but we redeveloped the new theorems and, and uh, models, which rediscovered this critical path analysis. And we ultimately, I ultimately adapted that to this fluid problem and you know, to estimate this leading coefficient. Anyway, and the other main part, as I mentioned before, was the big inverse problem was the X-ray tomography. And ultimately it was finally, even though I discovered this thing in 1994 out on the ice, it wasn't until 2009 and the much later development of the X-ray tomography that we were able to really confirm this and really look at the, really examine using tomographic methods, the microstructure of the sea ice. Okay, now this is all, all this theory is good and fine if you don't have algae, but if you have algae, they secrete extracellular polymeric substances, EPS, that affect the evolution of the brine microstructure. In other words, with the nice, nice sort of behavior like this, but then with EPS, it messes up the microstructure. This is actually the algae and it's being, um, and it's, uh, uh, the blue is stained EPS. And so we actually, the sizes, what it does to the geometry is instead of a classic log normal distribution where the cross-sectional areas of the brine inclusions, we observe a bimodal distribution. So anyway, one of my PhD students, he's now at, at Texas with uh, Clint Dawson. Um, he developed a 2D pipe model, but also rigorous bounds and was able to um, sort of recover a lot of the um, behavior that had been seen in the field um, in experiments and he's, with this uh, EPS-laden uh, CS. By the way, this is a really interesting problem. How do, you, how do you identify EPS in sea ice electromagnetically? Anyway, okay. Um, so here's like just a little bit, a little rundown from some of the experiments we were running for, for quite a while about developing e &M methods for monitoring fluid transport and, the, and how the microstructure changes with changes in temperature and so on. So we did extensive measurements of fluid and electrical transport properties here. You just see some of our, some, you know, just some of these scenes. This is actually setting up a Wetter array. So this is direct inverse, you know, you're setting up uh, electrodes on the surface and you're recovering the layering in the ice. Um, oh yeah, so here's me on the uh, uh, measuring, doing the first measurements of fluid permeability in the Antarctic ice pack. And, um, and of course, okay, the first thing you see, okay, it's the cover of the notices, a big scientific journal. So obviously these guys are doing big time experiments. We'll know um, they were playing soccer out on the ice. Um, while I was working, while I was working here on at, probably way after dinner or whatever on my on my little permeability goals. So, but so this is another one of these these cool inverse problems. What do I do? You know, this has been a whole evolution. I started out literally with my watch and a ruler, and I would measure how you know I would literally take times as to how rapidly the water came in. But um, and then you know you can plug into formulas and then back you know sort of invert for the permeability of the of the of the ice at the bottom of the hole. That's an that's an inverse problem. And um, anyway, but then it. We started dealing with much. This was on a, an expedition where we had only a really thin ice, so I could do this. But then we had really deep holes, so we had to develop a tent pole method where we it, we've gone through, and then we developed uh, we adapted reservoir technology. And anyway, that's the best because it's all sort of automated and it's, gets you really good results. So we've come through a whole evolution as to how you actually the various inverse problems that you go through to measure the fluid permeability of the ice. Okay, so this was some of our first inverse work. So actually, this is from a classroom. This is literally, this was our first instrument. This is from a classroom at the University of Tasmania. And this was, here's my Wenner array. That I was setting up and inverting got a paper out of that. And here's a much kind of a much cooler um, setup where we take these cores and then we, you know, these are literally nails. This is, again, this is from a classroom. But that's what I start with. You know, I just basically, as I often tell people, I usually do Home Depot science, where I sort of go to Home Depot, get stuff and okay, let's bring it up to Antarctica, you know, bring it to Antarctica and so on. Okay. So, but this, this was, these were really, but these were really important measurements. And the key, the key to the whole thing was getting the right drill bit size so that you make the right, you know, you never think, oh God, you know, just such a little thing like that makes the experiment total, a total failure versus, oh my goodness, this is amazing. And what's amazing, well, oh wait, I'll tell you, there's one more piece here. So this is much more sophisticated stuff that's, you know, beyond me. And this is cross, but this is stuff that Margaret um, knows a lot about. Uh, like cross formal tomography, um, these strings of electrodes, and then basically you're weak in this in this in this uh, uh, box inside the corners. You're reconstructing the 3D, you know, complex permittivity profile. 
And again, so what's so amazing was what we got out of this. So here's the Antarctic data that I took. And so this is the electrical signature of this fluid percolation threshold. So basically it, it's diverging at 5% and it's got the right critical exponents and so on to fit the data. Anyway, it's just a beautiful theory how it all, how it all fit together. And, and by the way, sorry, sorry, I say 2021 here because we haven't published a paper yet, but you know, this is worth going back 10 years. And anyway, I apologize to my co-authors. Here's another really cool um, tomographic reconstruction, sort of translating the electrical measurements into the um, biological and fluid transport um, characteristics. The blue is impermeable, so ponds can grow on top of it. That's a whole other issue, by the way, is how you actually, how do ponds grow? It's a whole other extremely fascinating thing that um, I, I won't go into, but we discovered that on a, on a recent Arctic expedition. How, you, how that acts, because there's a fundamental conundrum. Anyway, um, this green is impermeable, impermeable enough for CO2 exchange, exchange and buildup of nutrients, but, but you still support, so you have sort of an intermediate and then really permeable ice down at, down at the bottom. Okay, measuring sea ice thickness. So, so this is me setting up my winter array. That's one of the things you can do with it. Here's the warbot from down on the ice. This is, so this is actually what's inside the warbot. And this is also, the, the, my German colleagues have a version of this called the EM bird that they hang from helicopters or from planes and they get, you know, huge swaths of thickness data. And, but the old fashioned way, which we've done, which I have literally done probably thousands of times in my life is you drill down and you got, there's this cool little instrument. It's like, a, it's another, it's another inverse problem. It's a little, it's a little instrument. You get, you got to jigger it to, to attach the bottom of the ice. You got to get down through the hole, but then it has to open up and deploy so that you can get the bottom of the ice and do the measurement, but then you have to get it back up again. It's non-trivial, especially when it's minus 40 out <laughs> and you're freezing cold. Anyway, but here, this is great. So this is one of my first undergraduates that uh, uh, went to the Arctic. And um, so he's doing, this is the, the classic way of doing measurements. Of course, I think this is just for show. This thing is probably 40 feet deep. I don't think he got through to the bottom. And of course, he's got the gun because of polar bears. Although this was before they had, now when we write NSF grants, we have to specifically include like, it's, I think it's like, I don't know, thousands and thousands of dollars for professional bear, bear guards. Their official title is Mammal Hazer. Okay, so um, now more, a little more of the, the mathematics of this remote sensing problem, and which is fundamentally an inverse problem. Namely, you have bulk data, say on the complex permittivity. How do you recover what's going on inside or the thickness and so on? Okay, so we typically work here in the quasi-static regime where um, the wavelength is long compared with the micro scale, which is pretty, which is very often in most cases of, in many cases of interest satisfied. And so we have the quasi-static Maxwell's equations. And then the effective complex permittivity is defined here. And it's really, a, it's a tensor, of course. And so, but then it's a complicated, a very complicated function of the ratio of the complex permittivities of the constituents and uh, the composite geometry. And so then what we're interested in is what are the effective propagation characteristics of any my radar microwaves uh, through the medium. So the main mathematical tool that um, we use here um, goes back to uh, 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 work, independent work of, of David Bergman and Graham Milton. And of course, the Graham is, is, is a, has been at Utah for, since the mid-90s. And, and then uh, my mathematical work with George Papanicolaou, I guess my, my first, this, this was, Graham did it when he was, when he was a master's student. And then I guess the, the, our mathematical paper with George on the, the two-component material was, I guess, my, for, yeah, my first year of graduate school. And right, right when I met Graham, literally right when Graham and I met. And, um, and the forward homogenization problem, namely, how do you incorporate the composite geometry into the complex permittivity? And in this case, it's through a, what's called a, a spectral measure attached to a self adjoint operator that I'll tell you about in a second. And this is the basic integral representation, this so-called Stilte's integral or a Herglotz representation. There's lots of different names, but there's slight technical differences. And um, where this is all the, 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 complex, the parameter information is in this complex variable down there, and all the geometry information is in this, uh, in this, in this measure that you integrate against. And now the inverse problem based on this type of representation goes all the way back to Ross McFedrin and Graham and Dave McKenzie, um, when I think Graham was probably an undergrad, or maybe that was when he was 
I guess it's probably his master's degree. Ross was Graham's master's uh, advisor. And, um, and also, but anyway, uh, Elena Chukayev and I, and this is when we were working with Margaret and this whole massive sea ice, um, uh, the uh, Office of Naval Research Accelerated Research Initiative on developing inverse scattering algorithms for sea ice. And by the way, um, Margaret, I forgot to put, you know, I was gonna maybe put some, uh, the, those big papers that we had that came out of that ARI, just put some of the, but I totally forgot because it was all about inverse scattering and all this stuff. Anyway, I forgot, but that's where a lot of this work that I'm mentioning kind of came out of that big um, inverse theory project that the Office of Naval Research sponsored from 1993 to 98 or somewhere, somewhere in that, that time frame. Okay, and so this silty identical representation, again, it separates the geometry from the parameters. And this, the spectral measure is attached to this self adjoint operator gamma chi, where gamma is projection onto curl free fields or gradient inverse Laplacian divergence, where you can think of the, uh, the inverse Laplacian as um, convolution with a green, appropriate Green's function. Uh, the mass of the measure, this is what's so slick the mass, the mass of the measure, that's the Brian volume fraction. The higher moments depend on endpoint correlation functions. Um, the randomness comes in through the characteristic function of the brine phase one in the brine, zero in the ice. And what makes this method go and all the other adaptations and all these other problems that you're going to see is from this resolvent representation for the, the field variable, the electric field written in terms of this, this resolvent. Okay, and then this operator, gamma chi, at the heart of the whole thing, that takes us, that's the operator that takes us from the micro scale to the macro scale. And I like, especially now that we're doing a lot of sort of, well, you'll see random matrix theory and things like this. I like to think of this, this representation distills the complexities of mixture geometry into the spectral properties um, of an operator, which kind of plays the role of the Hamiltonian in quantum physics. Okay, so I think a lot of this stuff that I'm showing you here, much of it, not all the last piece on the right, but all this earlier stuff came out of that ONR accelerated research initiative that uh, Margaret was involved in. Um, and uh, so, the idea here is we get very, very tight bounds um, under some, you know, knowing the Brine volume fraction, some assumption of, of isotropy. But there was a very beautiful um, a piece of work prior to our work um, in the real case for so called matrix particle composites. And this is by Oscar Bruno. Um, and you basically, you, you sort of like a security sphere, you, you assume that the inclusions are separated. Um, and then we can get, you know, assuming, uh, well, given information about that, we can get really, really tight bounds. Um, but then there's the end of the whole inverse homogenization problem. And so one of the things we did was to recover bright ferocity from measurements of complex permittivity, but also in a, I'd say a much more, a much deeper mathematical piece of work led by Chris Oram and Elena Turkaya, who's, and by the way, you should have Elena. I mean, she's the real, she's the real inverse expert, of course, here in Utah as well as Fernando. Um, and so, uh, uh, but this was with Chris Oram, and I believe this was the first time that any information about inclusion separations had been recovered. So these are actually um, information about the connectivity of the Brian inclusions and how the, con how, or how the separation decreases as we approach the threshold. So, it, but it's, again, the way we get this is through a, a spectral bound, which then leads to these these rigorous, these algebraic curves and these planes that you can then sort of work everything out and really, really get your hands on stuff. Okay, now this is this this is really Lena's idea about how you exploit the uh, the Silchi's integrals and the the rigorous bounds coming from the Silchi's representation. So the idea, so here's the biggest bounds, and then here, so you, you might basically you you have a value, you have a measured a bulk measurement, and so then you vary the bound. So you go to one side, you still hold that point, and then you, you see how far you can take it the other way, but you still contain that point. And that's how you generate the inverse bounds. And amazingly, we can actually work them out analytically and get real formulas and stuff. It's not just numerical. Okay, another fantastic inverse problem. And again, this was led by Lena, um, where, where uh, we adapted the methods that we developed for characterizing the connectivity of the micro, of brine microstructure to human bone, because as you can see, they look very similar. And the whole idea then was to, given complex permittivity data, use Lena's regularized inverse schemes and so on to reconstruct the spectral measure. And here you can see the reconstructed spectral measure for young healthy bone versus older osteoporotic bone. 
And so basically what we were doing was uh, developing a new method for not hopefully non-destructively without cutting the bone open or whatever to really see what's going on inside there. And unfortunately we haven't sort of too, you know, followed up too much with this, but something we might get back to at some point. But of course the, the bottom line here is why can we do this? Because the math doesn't care. It's math. It doesn't care if it's bone or sea ice or lungs or brains or whatever. Okay, so um, we realized that if we could get our hands on this spectral measure, then we can really, we really have a lot. Um, because there's this, basically, there, the, the, I should say that these Stiltes integrals represent all kinds of transport coefficients. With this, and at the same, you have the same geometry, you have the same um, spectral measure. So the spectral measure depends only on the composite geometry. If you discretize a microstructural image, it gives a binary network. And then, interestingly, this fundamental operator becomes a rather complex random matrix, not a random matrix where, you, where each entry is chosen through, you know, from some Gaussian distribution or something, but where there's, a, where there's underlying structure. But, these under, but the structure of the geometry of the material is deeply reflected in the structure of that matrix and its entries. And so then um, the spectral measure can be computed for directly from the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Now, I should say that there were far more interesting mathematical reconstructions of the spectral measure, really using inverse methods, where, where you're doing high, high resolution, um, high resolution uh, calculations of the, of the complex primitivity in the complex plane, and then going to the boundary, going to the uh, taking the boundary values and sort of reconstructing what's on the boundary from you know, values in the plane. But we do it, we're doing the direct thing where we just calculate it directly. And that opened up a whole new door that we did not realize we would see. So here's the, 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 the 2D square lattice. 10%, um, 3%, there's the threshold. And here's our calculations of the spectral measures, which correlate with other people's calculations of these. But then what, 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 because we, we actually calculated the eigenvalues and eigenvectors directly, we could do, we could look at statistics of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And this was a brilliant observation by my PhD, uh, at the time, PhD student, Ben Murphy, um, uh, who actually worked uh, there with, with, Jack, with Jack at, um, at, at Irvine um, for, his, for his postdoc. And um, anyway, he discovered that we, there was this incredible transition. As you develop long-range order, you make a transition from uncorrelated eigenvalues to eigenvalues that obey the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble of the, uh, which is like Wigner dice and universal distribution made famous in random matrix theory. So that got us into, that led us into random matrix theory, um, initiated by Wigner and Dyson, who first used uh, uh, random matrix theory to describe the energy levels of heavy atomic nuclei. And amazingly, these same distributions, they say that we're interested in the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, that's for us, and, but there's also the Gaussian unitary ensemble. It turns out that the, uh, the zeros of the Riemann zeta function, their separations amazingly obey, it appears numerically at least, um, one of these bigger Dyson universal distributions. Okay, so here's actually the ice pack. Here's our calculations of ice, of, of the spectral measure, but for the ice pack. And so here you see the water phase becoming more and more connected. And here's our calculations of the spectral measure. And as you become connected, you get this big, this big um, uh, 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 delta component at the origin. But anyway, here you see it dramatically. Completely uncorrelated eigenvalues, follow, uh, uh, spacing distribution following a Poisson distribution. And as we develop longer, as the ocean opens up and becomes connected, then you get these um, you start to, you know, converge toward this uh, Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. Okay, but it turns out that this was only a piece of a much richer picture that we then discovered. Basically, the entire picture of Anderson localization in wave physics. Um, quantum, optics, acoustics, water waves. And basically, as you ramp up the disorder, you, you, you localize the wave functions and the, the eigenvalues no longer talk to each other. So what we found, we found a percolation-driven Anderson transition. However, and where you get universal eigenvalue statistics, extended states, mobility edges, band gaps, all this amazing structure that they see in solid state physics. However, what's so amazing is all that is based on, in, in, in wave physics, it's, it's wave interference or scattering effect. There's none of that going on here. And so in some sense, and I'm going to tell you about this in a second, 
But what in the bigger picture, what we've done is we brought the framework of solid state physics of, electro of electronic transport and band gaps in metals and semiconductors and so on. We've brought that whole framework of theoretical physics and mathematics over to classical transport, in this case now in random composites, but now we've in investigated in detail periodic and quasi-periodic composites. So I just had a PhD student, so he was in physics actually, he just defended the other day, and it was so, anyway, they want, anyway, he, it's just amazing what he did. And we really examined this entire beautiful picture, but in the context of quasi-periodic composites and a so-called moiré, uh, based on moiré patterns. And the idea is as you, this is only that you change the twist angle by two degrees and you've got a complete transition, a complete transformation in the character of the microstructure and in the character of the transport properties from periodic band gaps and so on over to basically what appears to be completely random behavior as you tune the moiré structure. And then this leads, but this is only a tiny, tiny little piece of the parameter space. Anyway, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. We're very, we're very excited about this. And to be honest, it all came, you know, it eventually came out from years ago from our investigations of, of sea ice. Okay, we've also been working on polycrystalline materials. And in fact, we have some inverse problems going on there uh, uh, right as we speak. And um, so we adapt, so Adam Gouley, another PhD student, he adapted the Stilton's integrals to, but for complex permittivity of polycrystalline materials, where you have information on the orientation statistics of the individual crystals of sea ice. And, but then there's, we have inverse bounds as well, going back backwards. Um, and uh, one of the important issues here is the distinction between columnar ice and granular ice. And so it turns out, and we have another paper, just we're, you know, basically we finished it years ago, but we're trying to get it out now, um, is the 5% threshold in columnar ice versus the 10% threshold in granular ice. And right now we're developing electromagnetic methods of distinguishing these ice types using our, using our, our work on polycrystals. Okay, up to the mesoscale. Um, another, so another PhD student, um, Christian Sampson, who I took to the Arctic probably three times in Antarctica once, um, he, and this is, this is really a tour de force, adapted this whole Herglot Stilchis framework to um, wave propagation through the ice pack in the quasi-static regime, where he gets rigorous, a, a Stilchis representation and rigorous bounds on the complex viscoelasticity of the ice layer for quasi-static wave propagation. And this, this complex viscoelasticity had only been fitted to wave data before. Nobody's ever had any theory of it. So this is the first theory. Of it. So by the way, of course, there's, again, beautiful inverse problems. You look at the propagation characteristics from a satellite, what were the flow characteristics and, and so on that gave rise to that behavior. Okay, another big area that we've been working in where, again, there's uh, the first work on adapting, adapting the framework that George Papanicolaou and I developed for two-phase composite materials. Marco Valaneda and Andy Maida developed that for the effective diffusivity in an, for an advection to fan. Here's the, the velocity field, so here's the advection diffusion equation. This comes up in nutrient and salt transport in sea ice, heat transport in sea ice with fluid flowing, sea ice, the behavior of sea ice flows themselves, and, and so on. And we've had, and there you can see some of the work that uh, Ben did with uh, Jack Shin um, on, uh, well, on taking this a lot further. Uh, I'll, I'll just say just a little bit about this. And um, here's actually sh showing some of the fluid flow geometries that we have, that we see in sea ice that play a role in thermal conductivity and nutrient transport and uh, uh, brine drainage and melt pond evolution and so on. And so here's our basic uh, sort, of, sort of new version of the representation where we have this pot, uh, another spectral measure. Now the geometry is in the stream matrix and so on. And so we've developed a rigorous framework for numerical computations, which we've really taken far. Um, these new representations, and Ben has developed the whole theory of moment calculations. And um, one of the applications here is to say first theory, first rigorous theory at all of the effective thermal transport properties of sea ice in the presence of convective flow. And so that's another paper that we, you know, we hope to get out very soon. And there's another one that a postdoc Noah Kreitzman worked on where 
Uh, a totally different method. She gets a Stilts' representation, but it's, again, it's another tour de force. And I don't know how she thought it up, but it's pretty cool. And um, anyway, okay. So this issue of these melt ponds is really, really fascinating. And um, their geometry, and we're, we've got very interested because they really play a very important role in global climate models. And so, but when I looked at them, I said, okay, um, this looks like a fractal. And nobody had ever asked that question before. And I was interested in, well, are there, are there features of this evolution that are very similar to phase transitions in statistical physics? So here's just a little, you know, back, a little reminder of fractals. There's a, you know, non-fractal one-dimensional Euclidean curve, the Koch snowflake, and then the maximal fractal dimension you could have in two dimensions would be uh, two, such as like grounding motion. And so motivated by area perimeter data that uh, taken by Lovejoy to show that clouds and, and rain boundaries have a fractal dimension of 1.35, where this is the basic relation between perimeter and area with a, with a fractal, we discovered, I thought we'd find, you know, some nice uniform fractal dimension for melt ponds, but we found something much more interesting where we find a transition in the fractal dimension, where we have uh, simple ponds, simple Euclidean ponds, and then we go through a, a sharp transitional region and we max out close to two for these very complex self-similar ponds that have boundaries that are behaving like self-similar curves. Okay, now one of my uh, I, I worked with, done an awful lot with undergrads, and one of my undergrads from, he took uh, Calc 3 with me as a freshman, led this whole study where he found a beautiful representation for the sea ice surface, and then you just look at the level sets. It's like the water going up and down, and we can beautifully reproduce all the, um, all the observed fractal behavior, but also kind of invert as well by what we observe. Can we invert, say, for the information on the statistics of the topography? Another very beautiful inverse problem and relevant. Now, one of the one of the methods that we're that we're you know I'm certainly the most excited about that we developed to to study how meltwater is distributed on the surface of sea ice, and uh, is basically a very essentially a, an easing model. And I, you know basically you'll see the pictures that sort of motivated it. So I just thought you know I studied in my postdoc with Joel Leibowitz and the, the Rutgers Mathematical Physics group, I looked at easing models so much and said, you know, instead of, how about instead of spin up, spin down, how about water or ice, you know, melted or frozen? And then I just followed that idea. And um, so here's the classical easing model, spin up, spin down. Here's the, 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 the Hamiltonian and the magnetization. And you lower energy by the spins lining up. Here's islands of like spin. But then what I realized was these magnetic domains that form for, you know, lowering the, minimizing the energy, well, gee, they look just like melt ponds. Here's a melt pond, here's a magnetic domain. Here's a melt pond, here's a magnetic domain. And the, the, and the idea of lowering the energy, maybe the melt water wants to settle in these little troughs in the topography. It's the same basic idea, it's just a different form of energy. And so we set up a, neat, a melt pond easing model. And um, you know, basically followed all this. I mean, it took many years. This was not trivial, believe me. And anyway, um, starting with a random initial configuration, as the Hamiltonian energy is minimized by Glauber spin flip dynamics, the system flows toward metastable equilibria. So we generate order from disorder as we minimize energy, and we nail the 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 observed um, predict the, what's observed from the fractal dimension as well as the sizes of the ponds. These are our Simulated ponds, these are real ponds, but the amazing thing is there's only one measured parameter. And that's how do you relate the, the scaling, the, the grid size of the easing model to physical space. And that comes from analysis of the power spectrum of snow topography data. We, we found that, we just did a calculation, comes out at one meter, and then when you do that, everything fits. It's kind of dramatic. Um, these ponds control the transmittance of solar energy through sea ice impacting upper ocean ecology. And amazingly, in 2011, um, massive blooms of algae, not, not out in the open ocean, but under the ice were observed. And first of all, that's a great inverse problem. How do you, how do, you do that? How do you find it and watch it and observe it you know, from above? That's an interesting problem, a very challenging inverse problem. Um, and uh, anyway, we went down in 2014 to look at all this. And anyway, that's when we figured out this conundrum that the the, the, the ice is way too permeable to hold ponds. So how in the world do, you, do the ponds get there? We figured all that out. And anyway, it's a really cool problem, but 
Um, anyway, so there's a lot of interesting questions here about are we in a new ecological regime now? You know, with all this, this under ice blooms and actually we just published a paper um, about how the, for the first time, not just how does, how is the upper, is the transmittance of light in the upper ocean affected by the area fractions of ponds, but now by the fractal geometry of the ponds. So that's what that paper was about. Okay, now just a couple of words, I'll be closing in just a second, just a couple of words on some of the, the macro scale. And um, so one of the really cool problems, and again, this is another cool inverse problem, is um, on short time scales, ice flows, ice flows act like you know, some sort of diffusion process, but they're being driven by winds and currents. And so there's all kinds of anomalous diffusion. I was like an editor on this, on this paper here, and now we're all working together. And um, uh, Hui Din, another PhD student, who just finished, now he's working at Courant on, uh, on their sea ice, um, uh, big sea ice project. And um, he, his thesis was on anomalous diffusion and sea ice dynamic, and he developed this beautiful model um, of the, a flow scale model where you can subject it to various forcings and conditions and see how the diffusive processes change depending on the driving invection. And now there's a double diffusion process here like because the polar bears, like we have some work now on optimal polar bear foraging and the polar bears, you know, so they're on the ice, which is diffusing, but they're diffusing on the ice as well. So it's a really, that's a double, like a double diffusion problem. Okay, now another fascinating that's going to lead us right into that big in, that final big inverse problem. So now we're now we're on the global scale or the, the scale of the Arctic basin. So the marginal ice zone is a region that's biologically active, a region of intense ocean ice atmosphere interactions. And in some sense, one of the definitions is it's where you have significant uh, penetration of waves into the ice pack. And we define it in terms of being above 15%. It's not just that sparse outer stuff. But not, it's not the dense interior pack. So you're between 15 and 80 percent. That's the so-called marginal ice zone. And one of the first questions, given that it's a fundamental length scale in climate dynamics and ecological dynamics, a question that arose a long time ago that was solved by Court Strong, who I believe did his post here at Irvine as well. And that's why I invited some, some of the, the, the people, I think it was Court's advisor, actually. I, I can't see if they're there, but this is this fantastic work of Court Strong. How do you objectively measure the width? I mean, obviously, this is this weird serpentine region. How do you measure its width? Well, he came up with a brilliant idea. Let's assume that it's like a, an, electric, an electric potential. Um, namely, you have, um, you're solving Laplace's equation with the, bound, the 0.8 boundary condition on the inner boundary and 0.15 on the outer boundary. And then you solve for the field lines. You go around the whole thing you met, you, and you average the length of the field lines. And we've done much more analysis on this later on. But what they found was um, that this was, uh, uh, that there was a almost 40% widening over, as our climate has warmed of, the, of this marginal ice zone. And one of the really cool cross-pollination aspects of this is that um, the, the method was motivated by how people, biologists, measured the thickness of the cerebral cortex of a rat brain. Same idea. I guess from probably X-ray tomography data or something. Okay, and I think finally, um, here's this polar data gap, and this is, or you know, you can see how big it was early on. Okay, and um, here it is now. And what, so what what we did was we used this same simple idea because look, the the Laplace's equation is the steady state heat equation. It's not crazy, you know. Ice concentration is kind of you know kind of related to temperature. The colder it is, the more ice you're going to have. And so we took a, a harmonic function, but then like a learned stochastic uh, addition to this, where we test the what's going on in the ice pack around it. And so here's our fills. It really it looks very natural. And so now various um, you know, organizations, institutions that are tasked with keeping you know, really accurate climate records over the long term for climate research, you know, they're very interested in this method now for, for filling in this, um, filling in this polar data gap. Okay, so in conclusion, sea ice is a fascinating multi-scale composite with structure similar to many other natural and man-made materials. Um, basically, the, the methods, the mathematical methods that we developed for sea ice 
um, have had impact on all kinds of areas of composites, but also, you know, a lot of, as you can see, there's a lot of inverse problems here. Um, the theories of homogenization and a lot of ideas in statistical physics help us to link these scales um, in, in sea ice as well as composite materials. And of course, ultimately, we're, we're trying to advance how sea ice is represented in climate models. And now these, in, in, and one of, of course, the main takeaways for this seminar is that inverse problems of many different types arise very naturally in studying sea ice, as well as um, trying to assess the impact of how the climate is changing and its impact in the, in the polar regions. From my perspective, as you can see, I think doing field research is very important not just enough to doing mathematics in general, but to developing relevant mathematics for the, for the problem at hand, given the complexity and the remoteness of, the, of the, the system that you're trying to model. And ultimately then where our research is in fact, helping to improve projected climate change. It's being incorporated into some of these, uh, the, the, these widely used sea ice models that go into the big global climate models. And you know, we're trying to, again, trying to improve projections of the fate of Earth's ice packs and ultimately the ecosystems they support. So, of course, I have a lot of people to thank. Various uh, senior, senior personnel. You can see Ben is listed now as as senior personnel here, um, and, and of course, Cork, um, uh, postdocs, and a lot of graduate students who I've been mentioning. A lot of undergraduates and some amazing high school students. In fact, I have I have one now, a new high school student that is. I think he yeah, just finished 11th grade, but he's already taken number theory and advanced and abstract algebra and all the calculus sequence and difference. Anyway, it's, I've been very, very lucky at Utah to be somehow connected with just some of the most amazing students, you know, even, even of course, graduate students and postdocs, but, it, but it, even at the undergraduate and high school level. Um, so we just had a big kind of review article, kind of a state of the art of, of sea ice modeling on the cover of the notices. And, this was the end of the biggest Arctic expedition in history. This is the polar stern that we put on the cover of the notices there. And um, let's see, so fun. And finally, I just want to thank ONR and uh, NSF and a lot of governments around the world that have helped us out when we go on these various trips and stuff. And, and thanks very much for your, for your attention. Great. Thanks a lot for, for a great talk with a lot of interesting perspective on inverse problems, Ken. So, so now it's uh, the floor is open for questions. So please unmute yourself. Uh, should, I, should I stop? I'm gonna, I guess I'll stop the, stop the share there. So, so uh, this is Margaret. Uh, can you hear me? I, yeah, I, I, I'm <laughs> unmuted. <laughs> um, so uh, Ken, I was wondering, this is great talk. I, I'm wondering if, um, is there any way of going beyond the quasi-static regime and actually looking at wave <laughs> propagation? <laughs> you had to ask, didn't you, Margaret? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, so so we did. Actually, um, uh, uh, Lubima Simeonova, and you remember David Dobson. So mm. this, was, this was right after our ARI. And we did do, you know, because I, I, I played one night with, Helmholtz or something like that, you know, and we, I did find some things and I started getting things in the right kind of structure, you know, and um, so she got a PhD thesis out of that. It wasn't exactly what we wanted, you know, um, it, 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 it was complicated. Um, however, we do have some, we do have some thoughts, you know, maybe you and I should talk at some point, you know, we, we do have some thoughts, um, you know, moving, moving in that direction, of course, but, you know, but we have not actively pursued that. You know, in, in a while. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know. Of course, that's one of the great questions. Though, of course, I bet Knut would be uh, good to have involved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, so um, I'm, I'm also wondering, um, what, what is the state of the art these days on the on the depth of the ice problem that that from from remote sensing? Okay. Yeah, and and I'm not I'm not the best person at all. Um, however, um, okay, so you know, there's these EM birds. You know that you can you really do get pretty good data at least when it's when it's relatively flat ice you know the, the picture i showed you at the beginning you know that's that's a little dicey of course right. yeah and how do you um, even define depth and when it's that very yeah. yeah yeah so so um the the older older measurements now i you know i'm not sure there's cryosat and then there's ice sat two now you know, one of the things that had to have been done, well, you know, to met, okay, so you've got, so you got an ice layer and then you have a snow layer. And so you can measure, bounce a laser off of the snow layer, and then you can bounce an EM wave off of the ice, ice snow interface. 
but you can't get that bottom interface, but you can get the water level. So then you can, so, but then you have to assume the density approach, which is not so terrible, but, you know, but then there's the snow, you know, so there's all this kind of uncertainty. And, but um, boy, I, um, you know, I don't know the technology exactly in Cryosat and ISAT mm. too, you know, but I don't, my feeling is we're not exactly, you know, don't, qu don't quote me, but I, you know, my feeling mm. is, we're not exactly there, but I do know there's still a lot of, there's certainly, and, but they're trying. And of course they're getting mm -hmm. data and so on, but, mm -hmm. um, and better estimates than even maybe what I just mentioned to you before. I'm just not as up as I should be with that, with that issue. But however, there's still an awful lot of activity, um, you know, on expeditions when there's ships up there and uh, planes and because there was this whole ice bridge, business mm -hmm. NASA ice bridge thing as well, which I don't know if they were using EM birds or whatever, but Problem. So, you know, yeah, I, I just don't know, but, but anyway, so there, you know, this is, but this is recognized as one of these big major problems that we really do need to get our hands on. And, mm -hmm. But again, as you see, primarily because of what I showed you, the radar probing capabilities of sea ice, why it's, why it's a different one. All right. So if, if nobody has another question, I thought I should let somebody else in. Um, I, I, I was intrigued by your comment that you don't have melt ponds in the Antarctic, but so most of the Antarctic ice is freshwater ice, right? That flows down from the, no? Oh, oh yeah, okay, let's, I, I, didn't, I didn't show my initial slide, my big slide at the beginning of the whole Antarctic continent. So there's the land ice, mm -hmm. you know, and, then, um, and then, there's the, uh, then, there's, then there's the sea ice. You know, mm -hmm. surrounding. And so mm -hmm. the ice around Antarctica is, you know, so that's, that's still frozen seawater. Of course, there are mm -hmm. ice shelves, you know, there are mm -hmm. ice shelves and everything. Mm -hmm. But, um, but why, you you know, there, there, I don't, you know, I've heard various explanations of, mm -hmm. you know, part, part of it is the amount of snow. Mm -hmm. you know, are there, are there ponds, but are they hidden? There's mm -hmm. humidity aspect, you know, there's all kinds of aspects of, why you know and and there are some pretty good explanations you know as to why you don't have melt uh, observable melt ponds in, mm -hmm. the, in the Antarctic but um yeah but, it, but it's more but it's more of a subtle you know kind of more of a subtle type of thing mm -hmm. yeah. hi Ken yeah. uh, this is Jack how's it going okay, hey, Ben's, right? Ben's doing amazingly well Jack all right thank you <laughs> so uh <laughs> great talk uh let's ask you uh uh, about the, uh, the photoplankton bloom phenomenon uh, in sea ice and uh, yes. what models have been uh, adopted by people in the area. Uh, okay, so we actually, I mean, uh, I mean, look, I am, I am kind of new to the sea ice biology world in some sense. Um, I've been doing work with under, we've been adapting like NP models, you know, sort of dynamical systems models um, for, but just for, for algae like inside the ice, not necessarily under the ice. Um, you know, there are, there, uh, there are very, mostly large scale numerical models. I think that's where so much of the work has been done, you know, in tracking biomass and so on in the kind of trying to keep track of overall glow, you know, sort of global uh, basin scale amounts, not, not as much with local dynamics, not as much with local dynamics on particular populations. That's what we're kind of interested in, you know, is really looking at developing interesting mathematical models. You know, for this, and also, for example, the connection with the EPS. You know, what's the dynamics there? How does the EPS, um, how that interacts with the um, the microstructure? How does that play into the dynamics of the population? But then, you know, the under ice, the under ice algae. Um, you know, it, that's a really new topic. You know, I mean, it was only it was only first observed in 2011. I mean, of course, there's similar. You know, there's of course there's similarities with the open ocean algae blooms. However. You know, one of the questions though is, and that, and there, and actually, so this was a, kind of a cool thing. Um, I, 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 I glossed over it in my talk. There was one, there was one paper that was listed by lead author Chris Horvath. So in 2015, the AMS asked me to run a one of these mathematics research communities. Maybe some of you have heard of those things, MRCs up at Snowbird, and um, they take about 40 postdocs and grad students, and we, you immerse them in a topic for a week. And the title of mine was Differential Equations, Probability, and Sea Ice. And um, I had all these you know, people from around the world as my, as my co-organizers or whatever to you know, sea ice experts to 
immerse. And so one of the main things I immersed them in was melt ponds and algae and all that kind of stuff. And so they really delved into it. And then, you know, basically by the end of the week, which led into, they got a science advances paper about really analyzing this new regime. Is it the thinning of the ice? Is there more ponding? You know, what are the physical things that are changing in a warming climate that are potentially leading to increased occurrence of under ice algae blooms? Hmm. However, they didn't really analyze the mechanistics of it. But, you know, this is just a, we're just scratching the surface at this point. You know, there's an awful lot of fascinating stuff to be done there, I think. As well as great inverse problems, you know, how do you know? Because, okay, we went all the way to the Arctic, you know, we went all the way to the Arctic and then. You know, we had all these amazing plans. And, and as, as I said, what we, what we were faced with was the most, this incredibly permeable ice. And so we had to completely change. We had to raid the kitchen to get dyes, to do new experiments. And um, anyway, it was so much fun. And we ultimately figured out how melt ponds evolve. However, the point of the thing was to look at this interaction between melt ponds and the development of under ice algae blooms. It was just, the 2011 expedition to me was described as, oh, they caught they caught the middle two minutes of an amazing movie. Right, and so the idea was here, okay, let's, 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 you know, let's get there before the opening, the, the coming attractions and stay to the end. The problem was we had to go back. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact reason, but how it all played out was we basically had to return to port um, just as the ponds were developing. So right. We didn't get to see any under ice balloons. However, we did figure out this incredibly cool uh, puzzle about how does how do melt ponds form in the first place. Great, thank you. Yeah, sure. I'll follow up with you on that. <laughs> Great, thanks, thanks, right. thank you, thanks, Jack. Good. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, uh, just a quick question. First, thank you for your talk. Very wow, very cool. Uh, you mentioned <laughs> ponds control the transmittance of solar energy? Yes. Um, I'm curious, in your model, did you take into account how algae affects that process or no? I'm just curious. That's a great question. And uh, yes, it is. It is definitely incorporated in, it, it, yeah. We did not in ours, you know, in our, in our, at least in our paper where we were looking at, where we uh, computed the under ice light field under fractal ponds, we did not incorporate any effects of a, a, a five centimeter layer of green stuff at the bottom of the ice. However, you're absolutely right. In fact, that really does affect things. I mean, in fact, that's, you know, that's a, that's a great point actually. And that, that's a, that was not, I do not think that was discussed in that science advances paper, but that, that's a, because it really does affect them. I mean, it really changes the amount of light, you know? And so that's a, that's a really good point. Thank you. And we're worthy of looking into. Uh, so it's a quick question. It's a matter of coupling or it's more complicated than that? Um, maybe the fir at first pass, it's less complicated, you know, because you're, 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 you're disconnecting any algae that's living in the bottom of the ice from these under ice blooms. That's a different kind of phenomenon. You know, we've been, we've studied a fair bit, you know, actually ice living in the sea, algae living in the sea ice. It can live in the bottom 10 centimeters, most typically. It can be in a gap layer. You know, there's all sorts of interesting physics then that's attached to that. But, you know, the interaction of those communities with the under ice communities, I don't know of anything on that at all. And I, and, I, and, I don't, and, I, and I don't know of any coupling, or I guess what I was, what I was what I, my, my first remark was, what I was saying, the first pass would be real, really simple. You got a certain amount of algae at the bottom of the ice, and that just, reduces the reduces the amount of light that's getting below it. That's all. There's no then feedback effect or or coupling between the effect of that community with the, but there may be, you know, a second order thing would be to then say, okay, are they coupled? Do some of these algae that are in the ice, do they do they seed the bloom? You know? Thank that's you. an interesting question. Thanks. Any, any other questions for Ken? To take a question, Ken. So you, you mentioned this, this marginalized zone and uh, the- I'm oh, sorry, what, what? You mentioned the marginalized zone uh, for the ice thickness, the- Modularized? No, marginalized zone. 
where you, you could measure the ice thickness. You mean the, the these EM birds? Yeah, mean? yeah. So what, what exactly are the measurements again there? Oh, okay, yeah. So what they do, oh yeah. In fact, actually our electrical conductivity measurements have bearing on all that stuff because they assume that the conductivity of the ice is zero. They've got a, you know, a big, Okay, wavelength and you know, a, a big transmitter up here, transmitter and receiver sends down, you know, really, you know, like 100 kilohertz, something like that, you know, really long waves. Um, there's the air layer. The, the physics is, you know, really simple. There's the air layer. There's the snow and ice layer that's assumed to have zero conductivity. And then there's the sea, the seawater layer, which then induces magnetic currents, which then generates waves and goes back. And you basically measure the differences in the height of the surface that they, you know. Anyway, so they, they you know, it's it's relatively, you know, it's not, it's not incredibly complicated, you know. And um, however, as I said, part of the assumption is that um, the conductivity of the ice is zero, but you know, we have a percolation threshold. You know, the the conductivity goes way up when you know. So anyway, we we need we need to publish that paper, you know. I don't think it has a, it does not have a tremendous effect, but it is something that needs to be taken into account. It's kind of an interesting, I mean, that's not the main importance of it. The main importance of that electrical paper is, is uh, you know, just an electrical signature of this on off switch basically. So, but, but I think it does have some bearing on these, on these EM bird type thickness measurements. Okay, great. Uh, so yeah, a lot of interesting problems and challenges. Uh, and uh, thanks for a, for a very, very nice talk, Ken. Well, thanks very much for inviting me. This was really, this was fun. And it was really fun for me to, a lot of these things I hadn't thought about in a long time. And it was fun to go back and look at a lot of these things that we do from, you know, from the, and it's like, wow, it's yeah, two thirds of it is inverse problems. That's right, yeah. A lot of uh, very interesting picture. Yeah. So, yeah. Great. Okay. Well, um, uh, so you have uh, you, your your semester is over already.